Hello, everyone. I'm Senia Chmutina. I'm director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here in the International House and also people online um, to this what I'm sure will be a fantastic talk. It's a hybrid um, seminar, so both people online and in real life. So uh, the IAS is the hub uh, of Loughborough University to host international fellows. And it, it is really the place where we hold a whole range of exciting conversations with the most interesting people who are coming from all around the world. Um, this is where we hold and we encourage transdisciplinary collaborations and transdisciplinary conversations. And most of these conversations, well, in fact, all of these conversations um, reflect the problems that are relevant to pretty much everyone in the world. And today's topic is perhaps a very good example of that. Um, today, we welcome Dr. Danielle Boate, who will be talking to us about being active. Um, so I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. Before I we start the official introductions, um, I just want to remind you that there will be time for questions and answers. Uh, for people online, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section of Zoom, and we will be monitoring it here. Um, also, we will be recording the actual presentation, but not the Q&A. Uh, and we will also be taking, of course, questions um, here in the room. We have quite, quite a few people joining us. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Eva Osei Kwasi, who will be introducing the next All right, thank you, Ksenia, and thank you everyone for coming and for those um, joining online. Daniel has a slide um, that introduces him, so I won't say much, but I just wanted to provide a brief background to this. So last year, we had a small quad group from my school, School of Sports, Exercise and Health Science, through what we call the Pitch to the Panel, and so we went to Ghana to organize a hybrid workshop. And so this presentation is as a result of that hybrid workshop we did in Ghana. So Daniel is one of our key partners in Ghana. And so that's why we invited him to come to Lafra today. So Daniel, over to you. I, I think you, you can introduce yourself very well. So I'll let you do it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks everyone, uh, those who are here, those online. Uh, thanks for joining. And I'm, I have to say I'm glad to be here. Uh, thanks a lot to the IAS for this fellowship and for inviting me to talk about a study that uh, recently is still ongoing in Ghana um, that's helped to improve physical activity among the people of Ghana. So I have a um, slide um, outline as to what, what I'm talking about, briefly about the burden of NCDs in Ghana and Africa as a whole, um, then to the study that we just and then the way forward and what we want to do uh, next. So as Hiba said, um, Currently, I'm a lecturer at the Kwame Kuma University of Science and Technology in Ghana, uh, but uh, it's also a whole bit of history there because that's where I had my bachelor degree. And also, I did an MPH, a Master of Public Health, uh, there also at the Kwame Kuma University. And then uh, from there, I moved on to um, uh, the Netherlands, where I did a um, Master of Science in Epidemiology. And then I think I lived in the Netherlands for some time, about 12 years. Um, I did um, this UMCU, uh, this Medical Center at Utrecht, where I did my master's and also PhD. So this was my PhD graduation in Utrecht University 2019, um, where I worked with migration and cardiovascular diseases. Um, so this was all by my PhD. And then right after the PhD, I worked uh, in a multinational consortium, uh, which we're looking at uh, degraded um, care for diabetes and hypertension in Cambodia, Slovenia, and Belgium, I think for, for two to three years. And then following that, I went back to, to Ghana. My research, my research interest is mostly on non communicable disease uh, prevention, uh, risk factors, and then also estimating the uh, cardiovascular disease risk among subpopulations. So um, this is a bit of my profile on, on Google uh, Scholar. Um, as, as, as a young career researcher with about 60 publications and also um, uh, citations that's at um the 2024 have number two more than 2,000 citations and then with uh, a high index of 23. Um what do I hope to achieve in the future as far as research and my career is concerned uh, to be a leader NCD prevention in Ghana both research and then education because currently I also teach NCDs at the university uh, where I'm lecturing. Um also have a family so this uh I have um, my wife and children currently in the Netherlands. I have uh, four children. Um, and then uh, that's a quite a sizable family, I think, to manage for now. 
So, so that's that's briefly about me. All right. So, um, I think I cannot uh, talk about fiscal activity without reechoing uh, the challenge of NCDs globally, and then limit, and then narrowing it down to uh, the African context. Um, every year, NCDs are responsible for loss of about forty-one million lives. Um, CVDs or cardiovascular disease and diabetes uh, responsible for almost fifty percent of all NCD deaths, and then over three quarters of all NCD deaths, including 85% of those which we call premature, happen in low and middle income countries where Ghana is also um, a part. And I would like to say here that um, as I traveled to Ghana 2021 to start teaching and um, up until today, I cannot count the number of people around me who have had stroke. A lot of people, a lot of people, young, uh, say that's a premature age, uh, less than 70 years, 50 years, and then it's quite a lot. So that's, that's becoming a major problem there. If we look at the top four NCDs, um, you can see that 33 million people die each year on the top four, which is cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, chronic respiratory disease, and then cancers. Um, and then also, again, we can talk about 77% of them happening in low income countries. So we bear the greatest burden of, of all these uh, conditions. And then um, uh, one very important issue is that um, people are not diagnosed of the condition, um, and then um, also control also becomes a problem, less than 40%. So let's look at that, the burden in, in, in high income, high, uh, high income and low income countries. Let's compare that and see. So this globally is infectious disease, um, non-communicable disease accidents presented by these colors uh, on the on the pie chart. And if we see that from 2002, there'll be changes in the disease burden uh, in the world. And if we see that now shifting more towards uh, non-communicable disease burden from 47% to 57%. Uh, with infectious disease dwindling, uh, um, what is that from um, 41 to 30 percent? That's uh, global. But let's compare uh, high income, low income, the same problem. So, you see, low income countries, even though these diseases are term diseases of, 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 of the West, of, of high income countries, we are not being spared because we are moving from uh, 33 percent to 45 percent. Um, uh, that is up to 2030. That's the, the, the projection. So what are the, 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 the risk factors that are underlying these things? And my, my focus is on mainly on physical activity, overweight, and obesity. Though diet is an important risk factor, I wouldn't focus much on that. Um, so in Europe, 15 percent of the population is overweight. Obesity is still at 23%. Uh, physical activity rate is 29% across the European region. But in Africa, um, also, also we have a higher burden of 31% of people being overweight, and then 23% uh, obese. Um, the difference in fiscal activity rate is seven points lower than that of the European region, sitting at 22 percent. So fiscal inactivity in Africa is also higher, around 22 uh, percent. And we did this uh, review, uh, systematic review in Ghana, somewhere in 2016, to look at obesity and uh, overweight epidemic in Ghana. That's how we termed um, the review because we, want, we could see the high rise uh, in, in the burden of overweight and obesity across the years. And we look at this. Um, the conclusion was that there's a high and rising prevalence of overweight and obesity among Ghanaian adults. And then the possible implications on current and future population health, burden of chronic disease, healthcare spending, and broader economy could be enormous for a country still battling with many infectious uh, diseases. And let's look at this uh, graph and see what's really happening. You see that from 1998 up until 2016, the burden is rising. And this uh, orange color is representing combination of overweight and obesity. From twenty, from around thirty percent to um, around fifty, uh, forty-seven percent, and now in twenty twenty-four, we talk about about fifty percent and over of Ghanaians uh, being overweight uh, and obese. So um, this is also leading to a high rise in multimorbidity. That's uh, multiple chronic conditions coming together. We did this review uh, of multimorbidity of NCDs um, somewhere two years ago, and you could see that there's very high uh, burden of uh, multimorbidity. Uh, on the on the on the African continent, also LMIs in general, and these are driven by education, um, sex, income, residence. We see that those uh, females, those with um, low education, uh, low income, those living in urban areas, they have a higher risk of uh, having uh, multimorbidity. But there's a bigger picture to all this data that uh, we are presenting. What's really uh, uh, the implications on, on mortality for a continent like uh, Africa and as, as said by the CEO of NCD Alliance, um, chronic diseases are now beginning to outstrip infectious diseases as the main driver of preventable ill health and death in low income countries. 
Um, and then also uh, by the mutual advisor, the relative risk of dying from an NCD prematurely is two times, uh, two to three times higher in LMICs than in, uh, in the rich uh, countries. So we have around two thirds of Africans with NCDs dying before the age of 70, but that's not what we see uh, in the European region um, because there are less than a third of people living with NCD who die uh, at the age of less than 70 years. So the average premature death is 30%, uh, mostly um, in, in, in Europe. The countries like uh, Sweden having as well as 16%, but let's talk about Africa, what we see is about 64%. And then the countries like Nigeria, Cameroon having around 70%. So um, it's not about having NCDs, but are they, when are they going to die? And then are they more likely to die? And that's what we see that even though the burden could be less in uh, Africa, they are more likely to die uh, from, from NCDs. And you see from this picture, um, so the, the, the deeper the color in terms of red and orange shows the likelihood to that the percentages around uh, 50, uh, 60, 70, we see that most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are more likely to die prematurely from NCDs compared to what we have in the European region. And what is driving these uh, is, is what we call a cascade uh, of care. Uh, so how many people are being identified? How many people are being uh, diagnosed, treated, um, controlled? We see that many people are dropping out of the care cascade, um, mostly in, in, in Africa. And as we did similar study in South Africa, one in Sierra Leone, where we sent in Ghana, so this is what we have. Uh, we are seeing. They are not screened on time. And even those who are screened, uh, what is the access to medication? Uh, are they being controlled? So we see that all these factors influence uh, ability uh, to keep them uh, also um, alive. And this says that about 50% of people with diabetes and hypertension are undiagnosed in income country. Income country. And this is reality that we see every day. So people uh, will be there before they go to hospital, they complain of headache. So by the time they get to the hospital, uh, they already have. Uh, stroke or they have a mind or that and as I said earlier on uh, there's something that's quite uh, um, I'm passionate about because of uh, I see this as everyday reality uh, in where I stay uh, in Ghana and uh, low access to NCDK also becomes a major a setback for ability to keep people alive from NCDs in most part of Africa NCDs are only treated at health facilities in big cities putting treatment for chronic disease out of reach of most rural urban and low-income populations. And therefore, one other issue is that when it happens in this way, people want to still want treatment, so they opt for alternative care. And these alternative care sometimes are not the best. So they give them medicines, they promise them that this medicine will treat hypertension, will treat diabetes. And therefore, even when they manage to go for some uh, um, controlled medications, um, um, they stop taking them and then they go for the alternative medicine. And then before you realize uh, it's, it's something else, um, they have the strokes and all that. So this study was about knowledge and perception and awareness, which we think is an important factor as far as LMICs are concerned in Africa uh, is concerned. And we see that the, the understanding of the diseases, um, the mechanisms and everything, uh, the epidemiology is, is, is very low. So um, in most part of Africa, uh, chronic conditions attain diseases of, of, of spirituality. Of, of the cause. So um, so when someone has stroke, they think some something spiritual happened to the person, especially when this person is young. So if, if you advise about preventive mechanisms, really don't go well with them, but they still don't understand why this could be uh, treated or could uh, be uh, managed at, at the hospital. So they prefer to take alternative uh, means uh, for the healthcare. And uh, this is what um, um, is being termed as a ticking time bomb in Africa. Uh, because uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the years to come, but this is becoming a big issue. And then uh, somebody also said it's a neglected um, um, crisis needing urgent attention. So we think now focus should be on NCDs, especially on LMICs, as has been in, in high income countries to be able to bring the disease under control. So currently, what, what is there? Do we have anything that could help us? Uh, um, it's opportunity for a study like a uh, climb study that we are doing in Ghana, what is currently there, that could be an opportunity for us. So um, there, there's been a lot of um, activities, a lot of research, uh, like this University of Ghana Medical Center launching an NCD care service um, as an app uh, to help people self-manage uh, NCD care, uh, Akumapa, which is a good meaning good act. So it's an integrated care for hypertension and diabetes where people are screened from their homes, referred to the hospital, they give them medication, they follow them up to make sure that there's a complete uh, integrated care for people who have hypertension and diabetes. And this really improving uh, the care for NCDs in Ghana. Now, recently, there was this funding 
that we've got a uh, key university where um, it's going to strengthen the capacity for NCD training and NCD care. We realize that that capacity is also not there. So climb uh, Ghana, we want to set up an intervention, but who is going to manage intervention? Who understands NCD care? Who is going to help in, in, in achieving uh, the goal set up? And this is, is what this um, uh, grant was about, it's funded by the EU to train healthcare workers, specifically on NCDs, to be able to help um, these interventions that is ongoing. And uh, finally, Ghana has um, now an NCD policy um, we're sending that to 2022 with most of the goals aligning with what we want to do, fiscal activity, diet. But uh, the implementation is a problem because even the workforce that understand NCD is not really, and that's why that grant uh, was successful because the, uh, the EU looked at that as an important step to be able to implement those actions that set up by the NCD policy. So with all these uh, in mind, and then the challenge uh, to look at modifiable risk factors for NCDs, um, last year we met in Ghana, uh, so climbed uh, led by uh, Amanda and then uh, Professor Amanda and then uh, Dr. Hiba came to, to Ghana. And we see some of the pictures from uh, the meeting, very successful meeting we had with stakeholders um, at the Noguchi um, Center in Accra to discuss um, the NCD landscape in general. We also invited people from uh, civil society, organizations who are working on NCDs and also a few from the government uh, sector to come for us to, to discuss what possible research activities we could look at. So we did deliberations for about two days and then um, we looked at possible interventions for the Ghanaian context and we narrowed everything to diet physical activity. And then um, we had some many studies that we, we, we outlined and the first one that we wanted to look at is physical activity among the, uh, the Ghanaian population. That is what I'll be, I'll be presenting on um, from here. So we had representatives from uh, most investors in Ghana and then also from Labra. So um, the study is termed physical activity in Ghana, the climb Ghana study. So the whole idea is to look at a center for lifestyle interventions in Ghana, that's climb Ghana. And then we are championing this physical activity study um, um, in Ghana. And we see that um, we chose this because this also aligns with the NCD best buys. So uh, the, buys, the, the best buys are what um, cost-effective solutions, the simple things that we can do um, to make sure that we prevent NCDs uh, in the population. So that physical activity is one of them. Uh, promoting physical activity through mass media campaigns, community-based education, motivational and environmental programs, but also counseling and referral services, um, also helping to manage uh, NCDs through physical activity. So what was, what was, was the aim of, of this uh, whole study that we set up? Uh, to assess the range of feasible physical activities available to Ghanaians and evaluate their understanding, attitudes and behavioral patterns towards physical activity and specifically to assess the level of knowledge of physical activity, the current attitudes they, can, they have towards physical activity, um, the quant investigate and quantify the extent of physical activity, participation that they have, and then the perception and preferences regarding various categories of physical activity suitable for adults in Ghana. So we believe that this is, a, is an important step to know what context-based uh, interventions could be done as far as this modifiable risk factor um, is concerned. This was a descriptive process in our study. Um, quantitative methods uh, were employed, and then we used um, six regions in Ghana, um, two on the, on, the, on the upper, on the northern belt, the middle belt two, and then southern belt two. Um, the study population was all adults, 18 years and above in Ghana. And then we excluded people who had mental health conditions or could not uh, have a uh, condition that could not allow them to participate in the study. Those who didn't have consent, we're also taken out um, of the study. So this is the, the map of Ghana uh, with 16 regions. And this is where uh, the studies are being conducted. Um, two from the Upper East, uh, from the Northern, which is the Upper East and the Northern region. Two from uh, the Middle Belt, Ashanti and Eastern. And then two from uh, the, the Southern, the Volta and the Greater Accra regions. And then these were the numbers that we were looking at. Um, so Upper East, Northern region um, numbers, we tried as much as possible to, to, to um, recruit people from both urban, peri-urban, and then rural setting to be able to understand, because uh, the context is very different in Ghana. If you say urban, if you say rural, that's very different. Even peri-urban, that is different. The facilities that are there, the opportunities, uh, the barriers are all different. So we want to look at how we can stratify these uh, by these regions. So this is how we need that. And the numbers, uh, the numbers were also proportionate to the population of the, of the particular regions. So we see that if you look at a center region, for instance, uh, we have 150, 80, that's quite about 310, the same for Greater Accra, that's 
the, the, uh, the most populated uh, regions in Ghana. But places like the Upper East, um, we have the 35, 17, 17 the, that's about um, 69 in all, compared to 310 in some of the regions. So we did a population to size calculation to come to this. So we target the sample set of about 1,000 after calculating the power and everything uh, using um, also design effect and also accounting for non response rate. And then we, uh, we did a multi stage sampling uh, technique and enumeration areas. Um, we followed the, the, the a previous procedure by the Ghana Demographic Health Survey, um, uh, as, um, recruited households systematically, and then also randomly selecting people from households. Um, the collection tools was research and developed questionnaire, and then we sought ethical approval from the University of Health and Analyze Sciences Research Committee. And then we gave consent to participants. Um, we use the Kobo Collect app. So if you consent to stay uh, to participate, and then we automatically you are interviewed. If you do not, you are asked to uh, or you are taken out of the study. So um, we use data for the analysis. Um, we did descriptive. This um, uh, presentation focused on the descriptive, but the data came in uh, just a few days ago. So we couldn't do most of the um, uh, comparison, the, the stratifications. But um, we did descriptives of frequency tables, charts. Um, also, did, um, we do chi square, which is that where necessary. And then uh, univariable and multivariable regression analysis to look at some associations between the social demographic characteristics, the analogy preferences. And also, we try to stratify by rural urban divide by gender, uh, male and female, to see what's really happening. So, these are the numbers that we've been able to, to, to uh, attain so far, uh, the data collected so far. And if we see that um, we are almost there, um, the total is 1,079, and I currently have 906. In some areas like rural, we've, we're still a bit lower than the 277. But if we look at the peri urban, we have 290 instead of 277. So we, we are almost getting um, to the data that we need. So, what's the age distribution? So, this is mostly among young adults, uh, 18 to 25 years, uh, that's about 41. 0.5%, uh, uh, but we still have um, a wide distribution. We have 51 years and more, it's about 6.5. So most people um, are within the young uh, adult age group with a mean age of about 30.6. Um, the gender, most of them are females, about uh, to 7%. And then you can see most of them are from the urban areas, um, 64%, 21% from rural area and then 15% from the peri-urban um, area. Now, um, there was a question about the perception about body weight. So we asked them, would you like to lose weight? And then we see that 52% um, <laughs> are saying uh, not really. Um, and then 23.3% are saying yes, definitely. 11.3% are saying probably should. I think this is very interesting because it's, it's aligned very well with the context that we find ourselves. I was discussing with Hibat this morning and I was telling her that if I go home and I'm lean, my mother will ask my wife, uh, why haven't you been feeding my son? Why is my son lean? And then uh, this is, is an ongoing, uh, it's, it's been there for ages and it's still there today. So body weight is very important. And in Ghana, we see that as a sign of wellness, you know, so um, people will not really want to lose their weight. Um, the same about the concern about their body weight, uh, about, more, about, about a little about half of them say not really, they are not concerned. So, um, but people say yes a lot. So I think what we need to do is to link this very well with the current body weight, the people to see which people are really saying uh, they, are, they are concerned a lot about their body weight. Um, the participation in physical activity and exercise. Um, so we asked about moderate to vigorous intensity uh, physical activity. Uh, what have they been doing? How many minutes have they been spending? Most of them were spending 30 minutes to one hour. That's the majority of them are 41%. Uh, um, and that's daily. And then uh, those who um, say they exercise at work, those of them are doing 11 to 30, 30 minutes at work. So that's about uh, what exercise they are doing. And then we wanted to find out uh, when they compare themselves to people of their same age, what would they say about? What they do? Uh, do they say they are less physically active or more? And about forty-two percent said they are more physically active, physically active than their peers or their colleagues of the same age. But interestingly, forty-five percent think 
they are about the same. There's only 30% who think they are less physically active than uh, their colleagues or their peers. And then would you like to do something? Uh, or what would you like to do about the participation in physical activity? Uh, so what um, do you think could be done more or less? Um, people think that they want to be more physically active. I think it's very important. And that's about 37%. We'll see something very interesting later. And they think, you know, they, they, they wish, they think they should, or they want to. And then 34%, 30, 36 think they want to be the same. They don't want to do more. Uh, and then 6% think they want to be less physically active. <laughs> so um, we ask them, do they need to do more physical, acti uh, physical activity each week? And majority, 72% think, yes, they need to do more physical activity um, each week. Very interesting finding. What are the facilitators of physical activity? What, do, what will help them to do more physical activity if they want to? And I uh, highlighted some key uh, um, points that they raised, some uh, key factors with the red uh, bars below. Um, some. This was a multiple choice because the numbers are, um, so you just compress everything. Some are saying that a phone app that tracks my physical activity is what will help me uh, or will help me to improve my physical activity or become more physically active. Some are saying uh, receiving alerts on their phone, reminding them and encouraging them to achieve their goals that they've set on physical activity. Uh, others are saying being active with other people such as family and friends, encouragement from other people in their lives, and having regular challenges sent to them by email. And I think this uh, issue about um, family and friends uh, is very important. A group activity really works I mean, where we come from encouragement from people. So recently uh, I teach um, NCD interventions to the global health class and then they, they designed a physical activity intervention for the class. So they, they are gonna use a, a, an app to track who is exercising more, who is working more. And at the end of the semester, that person gets an award. And you see that the interest is there because it's everyone uh, who's involved. So these are some of the things that we can explore, that group focused intervention uh, for the people. So what stops them uh, from taking part in physical activity? And then we see that most of them are saying lack of time, but they are too busy. And it's, honestly, if you look at the, uh, the steady population, uh, the young adults, they have to struggle with work, uh, uh, with, with finance, with, with, with feeding and all that, and therefore, time becoming uh, major issue. So if you want to do anything, you have to factor this and see what can they still do amidst uh, their still uh, busy schedule. Some are saying they are not interested. And this is something that uh, we say that um, people say they want to do physical activity, but not, they are not interested. And then we're discussing why is this possible? They want to do, but you know, the motivation, the interest is not there. You know, So I wish I could do something. I don't have the interest. So if you have the motivation to do it, then somebody tells me why I need to do physical activity, uh, maybe, and then gives me a clear guideline because someone said, not sure how to start. And I was telling him about that. When I was in the Netherlands, I bought, a, how do you call it, a, a list and that they work on it, a treadmill I was using regularly. I went to Ghana two, years, two three years ago. I just kept it under my bed. And, and, and these two, there are two factors that are, uh, hindering my ability to do that. One is my busy schedule. And then two, not how to start. I'm not sure how to start. You know, just going to pick it and then setting it up somewhere in the house and then doing it. I don't know how to start. So, you no, know, it looks very easy, but you know, the motivation. Uh, so it's still kept under my bed since I, I, I took it from, from uh, Amsterdam to Ghana. <laughs> yes, it, it was a new thing that I bought and I was using it very well in Amsterdam. But it's now under my bed in Ghana because I'm not sure how to how to how to go about it again. Um, people are saying it's not a priority in their life, and um, there was a discussion we had uh, instead about about incomes and and then um, taking care of families and what's the priority for people. You know, if you have a challenge, uh, work job challenge, and all these, so it's to become less active, uh, less important to you because all what you need to do is to put food on the table for your family. So how do we balance all this and then look for something that will still motivate them? Be able to do a physical activity. Okay. So we also ask their knowledge, but it's very important. What do they understand themselves? Um, because most of them were doing uh, within 30 minutes of exercise, and it aligns very well with what they understand. 
So they understand that moderate vigorous intensive physical activity per day is just about 30 minutes. That's what that's what they understand. That is why we see that most of them were actually uh, actually doing that. But people also think it's about one hour. People think it's more than three hours. So varied understanding knowledge about physical activity um, uh, among uh, these group of people. And then access and use of social media. I wanted to explore that to see. And then you see most of them have access to smartphones or electronic devices, uh, about 85.3 percent. And then um, what about the use? Um, among those who have it, 92% is in social media. So if you want to put something through, this means probably there's an opportunity there to explore. So what part of social media do they use? They are everywhere. WhatsApp, Facebook, Telegram, they're almost everywhere. You see them having access to all these. Um, and um, do they want to see messages on social media? Uh, interestingly, 27% said they are not interested. <laughs> but 30.6% <laughs> are saying they are very interested. But I think this is a group to target may be interested. So you need to give them a motivation, give them a reason uh, to be able to accept that intervention. I think you can be able to win them. Um, the role of um, health staff in physical activity education and counseling, uh, they believe that um, health staff could play a role. So doctors and nurses, and they're saying, yes, definitely. And you see in, in this context of Africa, most people are, have used um, interventions through health workers. Of community health workers, even we have the mainstream doctors and, and nurses championing most interventions, and it's really working. And these people believe that if doctors and nurses give them advice, physical activity, they are going to take it, and they believe they should play a role in that. And therefore, I think because they see them as, as the, the all know, so they know to do, and then they know, know what is good for them. So I think, um, it's a, and then 15% uh, say probably, so it, see, it's very equal for, for them for doctors and nurses, so we should explore how to really involve these uh, health workers in uh, these uh, interventions that we, are, we want to set up. So in summary, we said there was misperceptions about the body weight, physical activity, also about knowledge, um, willingness motivated uh, by group support. If you have working in a group, in a family, in a community that really improve the willingness to do physical activity, a workload and family responsibilities as a barrier to physical activity for most people, social media, healthcare workers, opportunities for us to explore. And if we see that, I <clears throat> was looking for this picture for some time, I got it. It's, it's a game from childhood to adulthood called Ampe in Ghana. And most people, uh, I know Hiba has played this. Um, <laughs> this was a child and even guys sometimes play, play it. How can we look at some of these games that have been part of the culture for a very long time? Instead of, it's a very active game. You stand, you clap, you do a lot of things. Instead of um, introducing some other activities that they may not be used, but it's a game. They play a game, but they're still exercise. So this is one of the things that we could uh, explore later. So what's the way forward? Um, we have to still do the, the stratification analysis by subgroups to really understand the data that we have. Uh, we look at factors influencing the willingness to engage physical activity. Uh, we want to do a Delphi survey. That's what we are working on this year to identify all other incident research priorities. And a key part of this would be engage with stakeholders for fiscal activity. What does the government want to invest in? Uh, what are their priorities on fiscal activity? And then also do a qualitative in-depth study to understand the reasons for the misperception that we found in this study. And then also do different assessment for older people. I believe that they are a different group of people. And interestingly, our study captured mostly younger people. So this cannot be easily attributed to, to them. So we need to do an assessment for them if that is our focus. So I want to acknowledge a Labra University, um, SSESHS, um, for their contribution uh, to this study. And then also uh, advanced studies where I sit today. I'm very glad to be here for funding the fellowship, bringing me to uh, the Labra, very interesting. And then also Klein, um, Professor Amanda, and then uh, Dr. Hiba. Uh, they, um, the, the funding for this fiscal activity data collection was through Klein, and then also Partners in Ghana, University of Ghana, the, um, Development Studies, um, Luguchi, they are <clears throat> contributing uh, to this study. And then also, we said assistant, a study participant. I think one of the key persons in this um, was uh, a student of uh, a professor here. Um, yes. Ines. Emmanuel. <laughs> Emmanuel, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So, um, sorry, you didn't the Very big and tall. Yeah. <laughs> But it's very active. 
Yes. Yeah, very active, yeah. I felt very safe with you around Bella. Right, so we yeah, are very happy for this. Um, one thing Ahipa has not done, is that I think two days ago, where we went for dinner and then um, there was an apology for, for, for the weather. Oh. And then, so as much as I can lead her bringing me here, I think she still need to okay. apologize for the project. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.